Svengali is best known as the evil hypnotist of Georges de Maurier's 1894 novel, Trilby. De Maurier most likely took the name from another enigmatic character, a mute six-year-old boy who performed in Hungary a hundred years before. During his performances, Svengali would tap out letters on a board and through some secret ability would even appear to possess members of the audience. But what most intrigued his spectators was the fact that Svengali was not made of flesh and blood like you or me. He was a machine, an automaton built in 1760 by an artist called Hugo von Lavasht. Hugo had modeled the features of his creation on a death mask of his own son whom he'd lost to influenza at the age of six. Many speculated as to what trick lay behind his machine. Eventually, von Lavasht hid it from the prying public and seemed to enter an obsessive, private relationship with his fabricated son. And rather than sleep, he would work in dim candlelight to the extent that he went blind within a few years. Unable then to operate his beloved automaton, he soon became paranoid and deluded and lost everything he had. Von Lavash died penniless at the turn of the 19th century. The doll passed through the hands of his creditors and later a small number of collectors. Five years ago, it was bought by an anonymous bidder at an auction in Philadelphia. Its current whereabouts remain a closely guarded secret. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. I propose a game. Let's play a game. I propose a game. Something's missing. What's missing? My shoe. Very good. Well observed. I'm only wearing one shoe. I have here a shiny shoe. Here a fairly stinky sock. Where is my other shoe? I hear you ask. Thank you, six people. I'll tell you where my other shoe is. I have hidden my other shoe somewhere in Nottingham. More specifically, in this box here. Or if you like, in this box here. Or if you prefer, in that box there. So here's the game. You try and guess which box contains my shoe. If you guess correctly, you win my shoe. You can have it. And I'll perform the whole of the rest of the show wearing only one shoe. That's the game. The game has a name. The name of the game is Darren, Please Tell Me Where I Might Find Your Other Shoe. So without any further ado, let's play a round of Darren, Please Tell Me Where I Might Find Your Other Shoe. Please tell me where I might find Darren's other shoe if you'd be so kind Please tell me where I might find his other shoe if you don't mind okay, box number one, box number two, box number three You're going to vote as an audience with your applause So applaud if you think it's in box number one Thank you Applaud if you think it's in box number two Very good And if you think it's in number three, applaud now Number three is wrong, as I'm afraid was your second choice, number two, also wrong. It was, in fact, over here in box number one. Never mind, give yourselves a hand, you did your best. It's not too difficult to manipulate an entire crowd, but the fewer of you there are, the more of a challenge it is. So let's make this a little more difficult and do this with just a couple of you. Put your hand up if you are here with your partner. All right, so I've never quite managed to get this up into the balcony on a first attempt before. Oh, yes! Up you get, stand up, stand up, both of you, up you get. I'm going to get a microphone to you, should be one just uh, coming along there now. What are your names? Louise and Ian. Louise and Ian. How long have you been together for, Louise and Ian, if those are your real names? <laughs> <laughs> Nearly ten years. Nearly ten years, excellent, good. All right, excellent, let's play another round of Darren. Please tell me where I might find your other shoe. Please tell me where I might find Darren's other shoe if you'd be so kind Please tell me where I might find his other shoe if you don't mind Okay, Louise and Ian Ian and Louise, I'm going to want a joint decision from you So one you both agree on And obviously it goes without saying It is a completely free choice Now what's interesting is this Ian is on the left, Louise is on the right. So Ian will be naturally drawn to box number one, the one on the left, and Louise will be naturally drawn to box number three, the one on the right, because we're drawn to things closest to us. But the reason why this is interesting is that um, I want a joint decision. So if between them they go for number one, we can presume that Ian is the dominant partner in this relationship. <laughs> because Louise will have submitted to his natural instinct. And likewise, if they go for number three, we can presume that Louise is the decision maker in this household. Is that clear, both of you, first of all, that we are judging you, yes? 
Yes. Yes? Academic in this case, because we can hear that he's taken the microphone and decided to speak for both of them. Uh, they could, of course, go for number two, although that to me would suggest a lack of leadership in the household. Um, any kids then tend to grow up without a strong sense of a moral framework. They end up uh, lazy and listless and what we might think of nowadays um, as drug addicts, sadly. So, <laughs> entirely up to you. One, no, or three. Joint decision, please. And Ian, don't stand for any nonsense. Come on. Three. <laughs> Is that a joint decision? No. Right. <laughs> Secret of ten happy years, though. Uh, go on. Joint decision, please. You can have number three if you like. I just want a joint decision. <laughs> number one. <laughs> Louise, is that a joint decision? I'm happy to go with that. Happy to go with number one. OK, number one is wrong. So, what's it going to be? Shit kids or Louise is the best? Three. Three. Do you want to change your mind? No. No? Ah, you should always change your mind. I'm sorry you were wrong. You should always change your mind. It was in number two. Give them a hand, though. I'm sorry. You should always change your mind. And there's a good reason why. There's a good reason why you should always change your mind, which I will explain to you, because I think these things are important and you won't hear it anywhere else. So let's try this with the most difficult situation of all now, which is just with one person. Downstairs in the stalls, put your hand up if you are a lady here for your birthday. Put your hands up. If I throw this out, can you get that to somebody with their hand up? Doesn't need to be the... Oh, beautifully done. Up you get, madam. What's your name? Abby. 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 Now, you did catch that right out the air, but we don't know each other, do we? There's nothing going on. Abby. All right. Uh, when's your birthday? Today or...? Uh, Sunday. Sunday? A round of applause for Abby. It was her birthday on Sunday. OK, that's enough. Got to crack on. Abby. You need to make a decision of one, two, or three. And so you can't change your mind. I'm going to ask you to write it down. There's an usher out there in the aisle with a pen and paper. Would you mind, Abby, just heading out? And we'll play one final round of Darren. Please tell me where I might find your other shoe. Darren's footwear must be somewhere. Where could his footwear be? Darren's footwear must be somewhere. But where specifically? OK, Abby. Have you made your mind up? Yep. OK, so let me tell you what was going on in my head as I put it in one of these boxes. In round number one, it was in box number one, yes? And then round number two is in box number two, which leaves box number three is the obvious choice for round number three, but too obvious. You might think we can disregard it because Abby is doing her best not to appear obvious, but that's where it gets interesting, because she will disregard it, but the moment she disregards it, she is then playing the role of somebody trying to catch me out. And then it ceases to be a random one in three choice, and it becomes the far more predictable choice of what does somebody do when they're trying to catch me out, which of course is to go for the most obvious choice, because it will seem less obvious, specifically because of its overabundance. <laughs> of obviosity. So I'm hoping that you, as everybody does, went for number three. Which one did you go for? Three. Number three, good, all right. So as did they, so I'm going to do exactly the same thing. I'll give you a chance to change your mind. I'll show you, as I did them, it's not in box number one, all right? Just as I showed uh, Louise and Ian up there. So it's not in box number one. You now have a choice. You can either stick with three or change your mind to number two. Similar choice to what they had up there. Now, your gut will tell you, as it did with them, to stick. To stick with number three, because I think, well, it's 50-50, isn't it now? So if I change your numbers right the first time, I'd kick myself, so uh, I might as well stick. But here's the point. Two boxes does not necessarily mean 50-50. You're actually twice as likely to win now if you change your mind to number two, which is counterintuitive, but it is true. So let me explain to you why this is true. Imagine there were 100 boxes. 100 boxes, only one of which contains the shoe. This is why you should always change your mind. All right? And I ask uh, Abby to guess which one she thinks is in. Now, because there's 100, we can presume she'll be wrong, right? It's only one in 100 chance she'll be right. So let's say she went for number one. All right? Now, obviously, I know which one uh, contains the shoe, and clearly, we can presume it's going to be in one of the other 99 here. And I only want to leave her with one other choice, so I start eliminating. I eliminate 98 of these boxes by opening them up and showing them empty, leaving her number one, and for some reason, number 84. That's the one I don't open up. You now have a choice. Do you stick with number one, the one you plucked out the air at random, or do you go for number 84? The only one that I didn't open up. Clearly, it is in number 84. Yes, it's in number 84. So two boxes, but self-evidently not 50-50. And the maths is very straightforward. We already know number one is a one in a hundred choice. That's going to be wrong. Yes, that's the wrong one. Meaning number 84 now has to be a 99 out of a hundred choice. Yes, it's going to be the right one. Exactly the same here with only three boxes. Your choice here is a one in three choice because you plucked it out the air at random, which means that this one, following the elimination is now two out of three. You are twice as likely to win if you change your mind. So you can either stick with your gut and stick with number three, or you can trust the maths and change your number two. But you're going to get it wrong because everybody does. So let's put some money on it because it was your birthday on Sunday. What have we got? 50? Ooh, 100, 100, 155. Five pounds. Five pounds <laughs> says you will get this wrong. What are you going to do? Are you going to stick with number three and trust your gut, or are you going to trust the maths and change your number two? And I'll tell you, Abby, no one ever changes their mind. I'll stick with my gut. Sticking with number three, yes? 
Yep. And you're wrong. I'm sorry, I did everything I could to help. You should always trust the mask. Give her a hand, it was in number two. I'm sorry. You do not win the shoe. You do not win the shoe, and I'm afraid, I'm afraid, birthday or no, Abby, you do not win the fiver either. Nope. Not even real money. Thank you for coming. Thank you.